Hi, everyone, and welcome to Science Policy Starts at Home, engaging at the state and local level. My name is Michael Villafranca, and I am the Senior Specialist for Public Affairs at AGU. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Artie Garg, who's founder and chair of Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, or ESAL, who will be moderating the live Q&A discussion after this event's presentations conclude. This event is the second in a two-part series. The first event was held Thursday, December 3rd, and centered around using community science to respond to community challenges with public policy implications. T today's event will focus on other ways scientists can affect change in public policy close to home. Despite the tendency of the science community to think big and focus engagement efforts on influencing uh, federal policy, the role of science is in, in decision-making is not limited to the federal level, which is why AGU's public policy team collaborated with ESL to put together today's incredible panel of speakers who will be sharing their insights about the importance and power of science policy engagements at the state and local level and how you can start making a difference right in your own community. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker, Chris Jackson. Chris is a fourth year chemistry PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, where his research focuses on the development of nanomaterial tools for bio, biomolecular delivery and sensing. He also currently serves as the workshops director for ESAL. Chris is the president of the Science Policy Group at Berkeley and has been an editor for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. He is passionate about science policy and advocacy related to energy, climate, immigration, and equity. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you to the session organizers for the invitation to speak on today's panel. Uh, my name is Chris Jackson, and I'm really excited to share some of my thoughts with you all on how scientists and engineers can engage in science policy at the state and the local level. So first, I just want to give you some perspective on my background in science policy. I'm a fourth year chemistry PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, where my research currently focuses on the development of nanomaterial tools for plant genetic engineering. So at UC Berkeley, I also serve as the president of the Science Policy Group at Berkeley, which is our university's chapter of the National Science Policy Network. And most of my remarks today will draw from my experiences with the Science Policy Group at Berkeley and how it's allowed me to engage in local policy issues. I also serve as the workshops director for engineers and scientists acting locally, one of this session's co-hosts. And finally, I have served as an editor for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance which is a great resource for early career scientists and engineers who are interested in opportunities to publish their work in science policy. Um, so today I'm going to offer some of my remarks on how scientists and engineers who are still in academia um, can really influence local policy through advocacy. So when I think about advocacy, really at any level of government, but particularly at the local level, I think about relationships. Um, so when I first started getting interested in science policy in 2016, um, so much of the focus and energy in the space was understandably targeted at national politics in DC. Um, but being based in California, it's not really feasible to have a sustained advocacy presence in DC in the same way that you can for uh, much more local policymakers. And I think that in this conversation, there's often more of a need um, for scientists and engineers to engage in their local communities. Um, where there often aren't career employees, um, specifically with scientific backgrounds who are um, offering the same level of support that policymakers can get at the national level. So as part of the Science Policy Group at Berkeley, our efforts have really focused on advocacy and building relationships in the California State Legislature. And what we've noticed from many of our in-person trips to the Capitol in Sacramento pre-COVID is that policymakers are very open to talking with us just because of our um, student background in science. I think it's often a refreshing change um, from the types of lobbyists and other advocacy groups that they hear from more regularly. And so that's an important way that I think you can frame your discussions as you think about local advocacy in your communities. And I really wanna focus on this relationship building piece um, with an example. So back in 2018, a fellow graduate student, uh, Danny Broberg, and I connected with some of our partners at Berkeley Lab and the California Council on Science and Technology to discuss the formation of a science advisor um, 
to the California governor. Based on some of those conversations, um, Danny and I spoke with several offices in Sacramento, including that of then Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, who has also been a strong supporter of science-based policymaking. So while these conversations didn't yield any immediate results, um, since then, Governor Newsom has appointed multiple scientists and engineers to his staff, including as a science advisor, um, who our group has close ties with. So I think this is a great example of how your advocacy can have long-term implications, even if it seems to stagnate in the near term, and really highlights the importance of a lot of that relationship building. So as someone who has a full-time job as an academic researcher, um, what can you do to really advocate for local policy change? I just talked about um, you know, some ways you might visit with policymakers at the state level, but I also really want to highlight that more local policymakers, um, such as at the county or even city level, are also a very accessible and often open audience to hearing from their local constituents, um, particularly those with science and engineering backgrounds. A second tool that I think is often undervalued in local advocacy is writing and in particular writing op-eds for local publications. Um, so if you're visiting uh, a lawmaker's office and you take a glance around, you'll see that they almost universally read the local newspaper of whatever district they represent. So therefore, I think um, writing op-eds can be a great avenue to get your science and engineering ideas in front of them, even if you can't schedule a visit in person. So as scientists and engineers, especially in academia, um, we write a lot, obviously and kind of being able to communicate those complicated ideas um, both succinctly and clearly is a skill that can be invaluable in any type of local policy advocacy um, you might engage in. Finally, um, I'd encourage you all to take advantage of your institutional resources wherever you're based. Um, so for me personally at UC Berkeley, I've worked very closely with our university's government relations team to help um, make some of those initial connections and schedule time um, with lawmakers at many different levels of government, um, including local. Um, I'd also highlight that professional societies, for example, the AGU, um, also have similar government relations schemes and also an abundance of resources that can help you get started in your local advocacy efforts. So I encourage you to take full advantage of those. So now I'm going to um, dive briefly into an example of some advocacy work that I've personally done um, based on some of my research and academic interests. So in September 2020, um, California Governor Gavin Newsom announced an ambitious executive order requiring all new passenger vehicles sold in the state to be zero emission by 2035. And this has been duplicated in some form across many other states in the United States. Um, so many zero emission vehicles are now commercially available. Um, but in California, at least, they still make up less than 10% of all the vehicles on the road. So if we kind of allow market forces um, to solely drive EV adoption and also siting of the electrical infra charging infrastructure um, that supports them, we're likely to see an unequal distribution and benefit for wealthier communities across the state. Um, we've already seen this happening with EVs, and we've seen it happen before um, with other types of clean technologies, such as rooftop solar. So kind of based on some of my involvement in studies at UC Berkeley, I was really curious and passionate about how we can develop policies around electric vehicles and infrastructure that better distribute their benefits equitably across the state. Um, so while there's a wide variety of policymakers in California, including at you know, the California Air Resources Board, the Energy Commission, and the Public Utilities Commission that are already actively working on this, um, through some of my work, I was able to find areas where changes in policy around building codes, um, curbside charging options, charger rebates, and car sharing um, could still accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles in low-income communities across the state. So based on some of this work and conversations with um, other local stakeholders, I'm now working to try and realize some of these changes at the state level. So it's still an ongoing process I'm particularly excited about. So that's just one example of how you can turn your interests or academic expertise um, into advocacy for policy change. Um, from a lot of my conversations with other scientists and engineers, um, particularly those who are in academia or early in their careers, I know it can be um, really challenging to find and then take that first step to get involved in local policy. I'll start with qualifications. 
Um, I think there's a very common theme that scientists and engineers don't necessarily feel qualified to speak on issues related to public policy. And I, I think that's fair. And I'm not at all saying that science is the only input in the policymaking process. Um, I think that as researchers, we often underestimate how useful our perspectives can be and how much of a need there really is for um, those data and evidence-driven voices, especially in local government where they're often um, not as present. So this leads me to my second point, um, which is to recognize the many transferable skills that scientists and engineers bring to the table, um, including some that I've mentioned, such as writing, um, but also more broadly, thinking about how to draw conclusions from messy or incomplete data, or how to build an effective argument on any particular topic. Right? These are all skills that we develop as researchers in the lab um, and can have wide applicability in public policy. And finally, um, broader impacts is a term that gets thrown around a lot um, where I am in academia, and I'd especially encourage all of y'all listening to think more holistically about how broader impacts can translate to our responsibility really as scientists and engineers to engage as active members of our local communities and to use this to ensure that policies made um, fully reflect um, to the highest extent possible um, scientific and evidence-based processes. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Chris. Looking forward to hearing more from you during our live Q&A discussion. Next, we're joined by Dr. Allison Smith. Allison holds a PhD in biology from the University of Louisville. She is currently the Brownfields Program Manager and Community Engagement Strategist in the Office of Advanced Planning and Sustainability for Louisville Metro Government. As Brownfield's program manager, Allison oversees identification, assessment, remediation, and redevelopment of former industrial sites. She also advises city agencies on effective community engagement and oversees the city's sustainability efforts. Most recently, Allison worked on the city's COVID response and recovery in the planning section. Her research interests include environmental justice and policy, inclusive community engagement, and climate change effects on aquatic ecosystems. She's also a part-time lecturer in the biology department at the University of Louisville. Thank you for joining us, Allison, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I'm Dr. Allison Smith, and it is a real honor to be speaking in front of such an esteemed scientific audience, because this is what I used to do. I have a PhD in biology from the University of Louisville, where I study the effects of climate change on freshwater food webs, including jellyfish. So I spent my time catching zooplankton in the Ohio River, chasing jellyfish, and growing algae in the lab. After completing my doctorate, I took a postdoc at the Center for Environmental Policy and Management, where my focus shifted from research to policy. As a part of that postdoc, we also worked extensively with Louisville Metro's Brownfields program. In 2015, I took the position of Brownfields program manager for the city. In this role, I oversee a $2.4 million brownfield cleanup loan program funded by the EPA, manage metro-owned brownfields, oversee assessment and remediation efforts, provide technical assistance to the community, and coordinate with the state Superfund branch and EPA Region 4. In addition to brownfields, I also oversee community engagement for metro. I advise other metro agencies on inclusive community engagement, facilitate sometimes contentious community meetings and lead a community engagement work group. In addition to my role with Metro, I am also an adjunct professor at the University of Louisville. In all of my roles with Metro, this is the basis for most of the work that I do. This is EJ Screen, an environmental justice mapping tool created by the EPA that allows you to choose a specific geographic location and then get data on air quality, proximity to heavy industry, super fun sites, hazardous waste sites, and even cancer risk. Policy created these issues, and only policy and the will to change can fix it. We are one of the 10 most racially segregated cities in the US. We often hear that our residential segregation is the result of white flight, but that really oversimplifies the issue. Segregation was actually driven by federal policy, redlining, urban renewal, the interstate highway system, followed by decades of disinvestment. As a result, most of our African-American population lives west of 9th Street. These policies not only resulted in residential segregation, but had enormous impacts on environmental quality. These policies decimated neighborhoods and resulted in close proximity to industry, leading to soil and groundwater contamination, air quality issues, lack of green space, and reduced health outcomes. 
As with many formal industrial cities, Louisville has been left with a legacy of brownfield sites, mainly in West Louisville. From former dry cleaners to tobacco processing facilities, these sites leave behind soil and groundwater contamination that's been the focus of efforts in Louisville for over 20 years. Louisville was a pilot city for the EPA Brownfields Program and has received assessment and area-wide planning grants, as well as over $2 million to fund our Brownfields Cleanup Loan Program. These sites are more than just re redevelopment opportunities. They are a chance to empower communities that for too long have been ignored. When you talk to the people who live near these sites, you learn how they've been affected, not just their property values, but their health and the ability to enjoy their neighborhoods. You see, brownfields are more than just unutilized industrial sites. They result in blight, higher crime rates, and even less investment. When you work to assess, clean up, and redevelop a brownfield, it's more than just cleaning up contamination. It's improving the health and quality of life for the residents that I serve. Our brownfields program has a lot of work to do, but we've had many successes as well. The former National Tobacco Company site, which has metal contamination as well as PAHs and VOCs, was granted $350,000 from our cleanup program. The Louisville Urban League was selected to redevelop the city-owned property into a state-of-the-art indoor track and field facility, the only one in the region. This grant will leverage over $35 million in investment just on the site alone. We were also recently awarded an EPA Brownfields assessment grant for this area, so we'll be able to support further redevelopment near the site. Since last year, I also oversee all of the city's sustainability efforts. And these are driven by our sustainability plan that laid out our initial goals for achieving a sustainable city. They the goals seek to protect the environment and reduce our carbon footprint. They include strategies in the areas of energy, the environment, transportation, and the economy. For example, one of the goals was to decrease use in city-owned buildings by 30%. So Louisville Metro worked with Johnson Controls on $27 million worth of energy upgrades and repairs to municipal-owned buildings. The project touched over 200 buildings and included water conservation efforts, lighting upgrades, HVAC upgrades, solar panels, and building management system controls to improve energy efficiency and sustainability in the city's buildings, libraries, and parks. In a single year alone, those improvements resulted in $1.9 million saved in energy costs and a CO2 reduction of over 14,000 tons. Another goal was to reduce energy use citywide, and we're currently working on policies and programs that will provide funding to low and moderate income homeowners to finance energy efficiency improvements that will help us meet our goals as well as reduce energy costs for those who are the most cost burdened. Another issue with disproportionate impacts is our urban heat island. Louisville is documented to have the fastest growing urban heat island in the nation due to several factors. Continuing loss of our tree canopy, which currently averages just 37%, our geography in the Ohio Valley River Basin, and too many heat absorbing services such as parking lots. In the areas of Louisville that feel urban heat the most, the temperature may be 10 degrees higher than in other parts of the city. Many of these neighborhoods are in West Louisville, which has some of the lowest residential tree canopy. Each year, heat-related ailments contribute to the deaths of an additional 86 Louisville residents. Louisville's Urban Heat Management Plan, led by Dr. Brian Stone of the Urban Climate Lab at the Georgia University Institute of Technology, made clear the increased health risks associated with our urban heat island and detailed actions the city and its residents can take to combat the issue. It focused on three main strategies, cool materials for roofing and paving, greening with trees, grass, and other vegetation, and energy efficiency and waste heat reduction. In response, Louisville Metro updated its environmental purchasing policy to include the purchase of cool roofing systems that meet the Energy Star standard. From 2017 to 2018, our Office of Housing installed almost 250,000 square feet of cool roofs as part of their residential home repair program. Metro Parks installed over 77,000 square feet and facilities install over 112,000 square feet of cool roofs on municipal buildings. In order to take that to the community, our cool roof rebate program incentivizes the installation of cool roofs on residences and commercial structures by offering a dollar per square foot rebate to offset the cost. This has incentivized over 800,000 square feet of cool roofing materials on residential and commercial buildings. 
Each year, we allocate up to 70% of those funds to our high heat districts in West Louisville. Much of my work currently deals with our commitment to the Global Covenant of Mayors, which we joined in 2016. This required that we complete a greenhouse gas inventory, set a reduction target, complete an emissions reduction plan, and a climate adaptation plan. Just a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that we are one of only 88 cities worldwide to receive an A rating from the Carbon Disclosure Project, the reporting mechanism for the Global Covenant. While we're proud of this designation, we know that our work to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions is just beginning. And we're currently developing plans on how to invest in utility scale solar to meet our renewable energy goals. When you work on policy at the local level, you're working directly with people and the policies and programs you develop have a direct and significant impact on people's lives. This means we have to be very deliberate in engaging the community and making sure that we have support and buy-in from those who are most affected. During the last few months, we have worked very hard to make sure sustainability was not put on the back burner. Here in Louisville, we are not only dealing with the COVID pandemic, but also months long racial justice protests over the murder of Breonna Taylor. We've worked to ensure that our city leaders and our residents understand that all of these issues are connected public health, climate change, and racial justice. We continue to focus our efforts on engaging those who have been historically left out of these conversations. We do this by building community capacity to engage in brownfield redevelopment as a tool for community empowerment and making climate adaptation and mitigation efforts relevant to everyone. This means meeting people where they are, maybe not literally during a pandemic, but by building on shared values to create a vision for our city that is just and sustainable for everyone. Thank you. That was incredible, Allison. Thank you. Lastly, we're joined by Dr. Chanel Matney. Chanel is an associate consultant in the California State Assembly Transportation Committee. Previously, she was a science fellow with the Cal California Council of Science and Technology and served as a staffer in the California State Committee on Education. Prior to her time in California state government, Chanel served as a research associate at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies in Arlington, Virginia, where she provided policy and process recommendations in microtechnology innovation and supply chain security. Chanel co-founded the Science Policy Group at John Hopkins University and currently serves as the Mentorship and Professional Development Coordinator for the National Science Policy Network. Welcome, Chanel, and I'll now turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Chanel Matney. Uh, first, I want to start out by thanking AGU and the conference organizers for inviting me to speak here with you today and for making this all possible. It's a lot of work and we really appreciate it. So I'm going to be talking about uh, how scientists and engineers can begin to think about um, engaging locally in science policy by pulling from a couple of different experiences. I'll be pulling from my experiences as a uh, former science fellow with the California Council of Science and Technologies which takes scientists and engineers and embeds them alongside uh, legislative staffers in California state government. I'll be pulling from my experiences as a full-time staffer in that same California state legislature where I was employed full-time after graduating from the fellowship. And I'll also be pulling from this amazing online resource that was compiled by a group called Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, ESAL. And they have a local engagement checklist, which is amazing, which you can find at esal.us forward slash playbook. And I'm gonna be using that pretty uh, heavily to sort of frame the conversation we're having today. Okay, so when we're beginning to think about how to get engaged locally, where to start, you can more or less distill it down to three main bullet points. First, you have to learn, then you have to meet your community, and then you'd be prepared to act. Let's start with the first one, learn. Before we go, you know, demanding to meet with the governor or whomever, we first have to get a sense of the landscape into which we are entering. Uh, policy is a huge ecosystem, right? Uh, involving uh, certainly the legislature, but also their staff, the advocates, the lobbyists, you know, program managers, um, budgets and appropriations, uh, economists, and of course, most importantly, of the communities that are affected by all of these laws and regulations. So before anything, as a responsible scientist, we have to educate ourselves and familiarize ourselves with the legislative process in which we are you know, trying to engage. So this means figuring out uh, how is my 
a legislative body organized at the state level, it's typically a bicameral uh, legislature. At the city and count county level, it may be a city council, it may be a county board of supervisors, the mayor may have some uh, you know, lawmaking authority themselves. So figuring out how is my legislative body structured? How often do they meet? Uh, do they have hearings? You know, typically a hearing is when a policy goes up for consideration formally and there are votes. When does that happen? During the pandemic, a lot of these hearings and public meetings, town halls, et cetera, are streamed online and open to the public. You watch a couple of them. Observe the process, observe the culture of the process. Uh, uh, policy making often has a unique language to it. So just getting familiar with the other types of um, you know, verbiage being thrown around when you're when you're at a public hearing and there's yays and nays and you know, uh, Mr. Chair, I now ask for your consideration of X, Y, or Z. As with anything else, there is a, a culture and a language and a procedure for how this all goes down. And it really helps to be just have a, a basic sense of familiarity with that. So just do you know do some research. The second part, and I think one of the most fun parts, is meeting your community for any given issue. You know, pick your favorite uh, heart issue on you know water quality, reproductive justice, anti-recidivism, you know, fair and equal pay, uh, you know, um, you know, racial justice. There is a community, a whole ecosystem again of dedicated civil servants, advocates, lobbyists, educators, community organizers, and program managers and fundraisers that have dedicated their life to moving that policy issue forward. Find out who they are and work together. Figure out who's doing the best work in that issue, who's already developed those trusted working relationships with elected members, folks who are fundraising, folks who have their ear to the ground and knows best what the community needs because they represent the community, they are the community, meet and engage with those folks. And when you're coming in, when you're coming in, think about the added value that you can provide as a scientist, right? Uh, so how can you amplify and elevate their work? Uh, given our experience with data management and data visualization, can you convert things into pretty tables and graphs? Can you talk to them about emerging research that isn't yet published? Can you translate the research that is published, often in very jargon-filled, less accessible language? And can you be that conduit you know, to sort of uh, put it into more meaningful prose so that they can, again, you know, leverage it to shape their advocacy pitch? In return, they will help give you the lay of the land. They may invite you to start you know, taking action with them which is the third step, take action. Now that you've sort of, you know, learned some basic, you know, framework of, uh, you know, how policy gets made in my city or in my county or in my state, and you've partnered and you've linked arms with the various organizations that are just out there already killing it, now you're prepped to go and act thoughtfully and strategically, right? Action can take many different forms. Certainly, uh, often we first think of, I want so-and-so to vote yay or nay on a particular bill, all right? Well, all of that has a very specific and precise timing. Uh, so you can go and you can ask for meetings with your elected reps uh, and with their staff. You can advocate for funding for your favorite measure or for your favorite program. You can uh, choose to campaign for a candidate for office, uh, helping them to shape the helping them to shape their platform that could include door knocking that could include canvas phone calling that can help them answer uh, policy questions that they're being um, you know sort of posed at interviews you can help them you know have a more evidence driven sort of perspective narrative and flow in addition uh, scientists can also serve as a uh, public witness as during a hearing uh, researchers may be asked to provide official written or oral testimony as a subject matter specialist, you know, in a particular area. Uh, that can be a very valuable way to act as well. These are just a couple of examples, you know, of ways that you can engage, but from every uh, step of the policy process, from the time that a bill is born to the time that it's being heard in front of various deliberative committee bodies, to the time that it's going in front of some executive office to be signed, there are dozens and dozens of access points where there's opportunities for you to 
have conversations with folks that are engaging with that bill. The people who are going to know how to do that best, again, is the community. So uh, a couple of community groups I can already point you to include ETEL, engineers and scientists acting locally. Certainly it includes AGU and other scientific societies. It includes groups like NSPN, the National Science Policy Network with whom I serve. This is a nationwide network of university-based science policy groups, so based locally, that advocate and engage, run science policy programs, do science communication and training, hill days, advocacy days, uh, you know, town hall sessions, et cetera. Uh, and of course, uh, you can partner with groups as well, like um, uh, certainly AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, uh, 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 the, the Union of Concerned Scientists, you know, there, there's, a, there's a host of groups that uh, do this work and often have local chapters. If you'd like to learn more, I invite you to come uh, engage with me over at the National Science Policy Network, where I serve as their mentorship and professional development coordinator. Um, I'm sure AGU will be able to share my details, but you can always email me at mentorship at scipolnetwork.org. Uh, and so with that, I look forward to engaging in the Q&A, but to summarize, when you're thinking about how to engage locally, first, learn the landscape, meet and engage with your community, think about the added value you can bring as a scientist and with that research background, and then with those two under your belt, think thoughtfully and strategically about how to <laughs> Thanks so much for your time and have a great rest of the conference. Bye. Think globally, act locally. This statement, which I first heard while learning about Earth Day is, as a child, still delivers a powerful call to action for all of us. Hi, my name is Arthi Garg, founder and chair of Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally. I am absolutely thrilled to be moderating the live Q&A about local engagement with such an amazing set of panelists that you all just heard from. Um, before we get started with the discussion, I just want to say a couple words about engineers and scientists acting locally. I think a couple of our panelists were so kind as to talk about um, our organization as well. Engineers and Scientists Acting Locally, or ESAL, is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit. Our mission is to get more engineers and scientists engaged with their local governments. And our goals in how to do that and accomplish that are to inspire you to get engaged locally. And then once we've inspired you to provide you with the resources you would need to do so effectively. We believe as an organization that civic engagement is, is a critical part of the conduct and practice of science. And we hope to help you on that journey to being engaged members of your community. Please visit our website, www.esal.us, and subscribe to our monthly newsletter to find our resources and to learn more about what we're doing. Now, let's jump into today's discussion with this great group of panelists. And um, I just want to ask everyone in the audience, I, I believe you have a chat function where you can add questions. So please feel free to do so. And I will try to um, ask the panelists to address them during this Q&A period. So, Everyone, Allison, Chanel, Chris, thank you so much for these amazing introductions in how you have leveraged your backgrounds in science to engage locally. I'd like to start with one question. We talked a little bit about skills. Chanel, you laid out a lot of details about what skills might be useful in thinking about lo local engagement. Can each of you talk a little bit about which skills you think have been the most essential to your efforts related to developing local policy or engaging with local policy major, ma um, makers? And where did you learn those skills and how can other people get um, learn those skills as well? And I, I just jump in or maybe um, we'll go in alphabetical order to start. Allison, <laughs> let's start with you. Sure, thanks for the question, Artie. I think that um, one of the best tools you have in your, your toolbox is science communication. So we all speak the language of science. You know, I'm a biologist. Those are the terms that I speak in. Um, 
and often you go to, let's say, a Metro Council member and, you know, they're interested in climate change, but they're not going to speak that language. So especially when you're talking to decision makers, really being able to communicate very complex scientific concepts into everyday terms that has meaning to people. And it's also about relating it to people's lives. So, you know, when we do research, it's sometimes very theoretical, but we have to relate those things that we're talking about to how it affects people in everyday life. And that's a skill that I learned in graduate school in giving just, you know, many presentations to lots of different audiences. I would encourage you anytime you're invited to give a presentation, even if it's to a garden club, take it and learn how to communicate your research and your work into to understandable terms. Great, thanks for that answer. Chanel, can I ask you to provide your perspective? Absolutely, I couldn't agree with Allison more. A science communication is so key and sort of thinking about what that looks like operationally, I think about distillation and integration, right? And so it's definitely not dumbing it down. You're distilling it up is the way that I like to think about it, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's really key to be able to pull down sort of what are the key facts and features that you need to know and then integrate that into a conversation about why it's relevant and why it's resonant. Even using little language, um, you know, sort of, um, kind of games like not dumbing it down, distilling it up. If you can have a bumper sticker or a nice sort of resonant visual analogies when you're describing your science or making a message, that, that's um, really helpful. Uh, storytelling in our communications is a way that people connect with what you're saying, and it's the way that they remember what you're saying after they leave. So the, the better that we can get at distilling it up, storytelling and integrating, uh, those skills continue to be very helpful. And Chris, um, can you please share your thoughts on skills? Yeah, I'll definitely echo the bit about science communication and I'll build on something Chanel mentioned, I believe during her talk as well, which is science visualization. And I think really being able to um, take data and present it in a way that's accessible, it can be a really um, key asset when you're advocating particularly at the local level. Um, as someone in at a university, I think I've gained a lot of experience and a lot of practice just from you know, practicing that science communication with folks outside of the sciences. So I work with a lot of folks in like the MBA program, for example, and they ask a lot of very different questions than you get from when you're talking about your science with even other scientists in different fields. So I think just the more practice you can get talking with folks outside of science um, and whether that's in written format or oral format, um, that can just be a great asset to kind of think about the types of questions that policymakers might raise and types of issues that they might care about most. Great, thank you so much for that diverse set of perspectives. We have a question from the audience, an interesting question. I'm gonna start with you on this, Chris, and then Chanel and Allison invite you to um, add if you feel um, like you would like to, but this came from the audience and it, I think it's talking a little bit about advocacy. So the question is, have you come up against anti-science attitudes from policymakers? And if you did, what were the specific topics that triggered the stance? And I'm gonna take my moderator privilege a little bit and then add to that and say, and, and then how did you kind of overcome that attitude in order to continue a conversation if you were able to do so? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's definitely something we've run into. Um, I mentioned briefly in my opening remarks how we we're kind of advocating at the California state level for um, creating like a science advisor to the governor position. Um, when we were meeting with various legislative offices to kind of think about how that might be actualized, um, we did get some pushback um, from folks who were like, this is maybe not necessary. This is something that um, we don't think should be coming from the legislative side, um, which is fair. Um, and we've also, I've done some advocacy around um, like electric vehicle infrastructure around climate change. And I think I've heard similar arguments um, from various perspectives. And I think it's all about framing. And again, kind of thinking about who you're communicating with and how can you change it? Um, particular, if there's pushback against, for example, um, maybe energy standards or um, climate change practices, um, sometimes reframing it as climate adaptation, reframing it as um, issues that are very pertinent. Um, in California, there are wildfires is a big issue right now. So there's um, definitely lawmakers um, who, regardless of um, their positions on broader impacts of climate change, realize that this is a pressing issue for their community. And so that might lead them to support um, various issues that maybe don't necessarily fit within their broader portfolio. So I really think framing that can be helpful. 
And I hate to make this a, a partisan issue, but unfortunately it is. Um, you know, Louisville is a little blue dot in a very red state. So, um, so much of what we're trying to do locally around, you know, investments in renewable and energy efficiency, we really hit a roadblock at the state level. Um, so much of our state, um, is more rural areas. They haven't seen as many of the effects as we have in the more urban areas. So even just getting um, basic uh, climate change standards or climate change goals at the state level has been an uphill battle. And for us, um, you know, you have to pick your battles. And so we've really focused on things that we have control of locally um, that we can do at a city level. And that's that's not always what you want to hear, but um, those are the things that we can control and that we can really push forward and also demonstrate that these things can be done. It can boost your economy and others can see all of the benefits that come from those changes. Thank you. Uh, Chanel, did you want to add to this um, question or should I have we... a very specific. Absolutely. No, I have a very, I think, relevant and recent example from my time at the legislative staffer in the um, California State Transportation Committee. And so there I was serving as the um, subject matter advisor to various California level elected officials. And the specific example, uh, since I was working on transportation was a COVID related bailout for masses, um, fares, you know, finance operations of mass transit. And as people were staying home, uh, Okay, I think we might have lost Chanel's feed for just a second. Um, I hopefully she'll be able to jump back in and rejoin us. In the meantime, I'm going to jump um, to the next question and you know hope that Chanel is able to rejoin us and um, you know finish answering that question and also jump in on some other questions as well. Um, I had one question that actually was primarily directed at Allison and Chris, so I'll, I'll send that one. Um, both of you touched on issues where science and technology are you know, pretty tightly intertwined with equity concerns in your presentations. And of course, you know, I also want to point out that understanding how to tackle Hi, equity everyone. issues welcome to in society is itself an entire area of social science. But, you know, I imagine that kind of really broad um, interdisciplinary work, you know, working from social science to, you know, potentially artificial intelligence or very advanced technologies is, is relatively common in policymaking. I can certainly, you know, say that I've observed that it's a big part of responding to COVID at the local level these days. Can you talk about, you know, what you found to be effective ways to work across STEM disciplines and really bring in so many different types of expertise? I mean, even, you know, STEM areas of expertise plus potentially others like say law. Um, something like that. Um, maybe I, Allison, I'll ask you to start, and Chris, and I think we have Chanel back, um, and you might want to jump in too, but let's start with you, Allison. Sure. Um, local government, just like most of academia, tends to be very siloed, and that's, that's just something that we deal with every day. Um, I've had the opportunity to collaborate on some research um, with some friends at the University of Louisville, um, an anthropologist, a psychologist, a sociologist, and a public health practitioner. And bringing that team to the table and allowing the policymakers and decision makers to see the benefits of this type of collaborative research and what they all bring to the table, um, I think has helped me make the argument of this connection between you know, these climate change issues, racial justice, public health, pandemics, um, as I mentioned in my talk, these are all connected and we can't treat them individually. We can't solve them individually. So I think um, being able to demonstrate to policymakers the value of having those people at the table has been something that I've been really proud of being able to do in my time here. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, Chris, and then I think Chanel, you, um, it'd be great if you're able to respond as well. 
Yeah, I um, can jump in and add that. Um, I think there's, I've had a lot of value. I'm kind of, again, kind of working interdisciplinary and really thinking about when doing local policy making, thinking about other folks, both within STEM and outside of STEM as well, who are active in the space and kind of um, think about how I can engage them and build upon work that's already being done. Um, one example that kind of builds off some of the EV infrastructure um, discussions that I mentioned um, during my recorded talk, um, that was, when I first started, those were not the recommendations I had started out with. And those are not kind of the um, goals that I had come to um, on my own or through conversation with others. Um, but I was really thinking about, if we're talking about electrical vehicles, um, a simple solution that maybe different policies have proposed, whether it's just rebates or stuff like that, really don't work for a large majority of people, for the folks who don't own a car, for the folks who live in multi-unit dwellings, who don't have access to charging infrastructure. So I think it's really critical that all of these discussions around policy and particularly um, for scientists and engineers who are starting to get engaged in local policy making and maybe have different ideas to really consider the different perspectives and the different needs by talking to other local stakeholders and people outside of your area of expertise because that can really um, lend to a much more holistic um, policy making that's much more likely to have an impact. Thanks, Chris. Chanel? Sure, I apologize for the drop off, but actually the question that I was um, answering ties into this one, so I'll, I'll fuse the two together. Um, I, I was talking about um, uh, a, a COVID related bailout uh, for transit, which uh, is a large sum of money, uh, despite the fact that there is just a very, very narrow uh, or a small population of people that needed to continue to ride transit uh, that often skews lower income, you know, persons of color, persons in food deserts or with not a lot of community or um, industry infrastructure, but also a lot of your frontline workers, you know, folks that are, you know, continuing to support the rest of society during the pandemic. And so there was some pushback from lawmakers who were looking at, oh, you know, there's been a 90% drop in ridership for transit, yet you're acting for a multi-million dollar bailout. What's the return on value? And so then we have to have a conversation about the science of public transit and who's riding and, and what the impact would be of limiting their options. We had to talk about the equity issues at play, right? Since this would uh, predominantly disproportionately impact uh, communities that are already uh, more hard off. You have to talk about the public health implications of uh, not having, uh, you know, government, you know, subsidized transportation and what other mobility options would there be and how would that support, uh, you know, safe, um, sort of safe public health measures. And then we had to talk about sort of larger equity of it all. And then just sort of thinking about what tone, what a precedent does this set, you know, if the government sort of takes a stance that this 3% population is deemed not to be sufficient enough or worthy enough or important enough to continue that ongoing funding. So uh, to answer the question of how we, number one, sort of integrated across those different policy areas, and then two, dealt with what in my view is sort of an anti-science, anti-equity argument, was sort of to um, share personal stories, particularly that were from the communities that those elected members represented, um, and then address the concern. The concern was that everything's on fire, our budgets are really constrained. And so I, we tried to answer the question, what is the return on value? So we got more data. We were able to ask the transit agencies to uh, gather data on who exactly is riding and in which neighborhoods and in general, what sectors of the population that was to demonstrate that it was your nurses and your uh, sanitation staff and your, your doctors working these late 3 a.m. shifts when they were able to really see and appreciate and buy into this idea that yes, it's expensive and it's worth it. And that's one of the jobs of government is to step in where for various reasons, the private sector isn't well suited to or isn't able to, that's really important. Uh, we were able to talk to budget people about, okay, let's say there is willingness, where does the money come from? How do we tie in financial accountability and transparency for folks that were worried about um, you know, how do you know this money is being responsibly spent? And so again, we were asking the transit agencies to continue to track data. And when they were shutting down lines or cutting routes, to do so in a way that would minimize uh, disruption to well-traveled lines, particularly lines to uh, food or to markets or to pharmacies or to hospitals, so that such that when there were shutdowns, we could sort of, you know, minimize the negative impact so again, when people are, you know, let's say anti-science or anti-evidence, what is the underlying concern? Sometimes it's resource constraints. Can you address that? Sometimes it's, it's a misperception. 
I had members who say, I see all these buses running and they're empty. I see empty buses running. This is a huge waste of resources. That was a misperception. We pulled back data saying, actually, during these times of day for these specific sectors of workers, you know, they're there and, and they need to be there and they have nowhere else to go. So I, I know you see an empty bus, but that's sort of a, um, you know, a, like a, a fallacy. And so just to sum up, uh, really actively listen to where the objections are coming from and see if you can present additional information to alleviate those. Thanks, Janelle. Um, so I have one question that's very specific to, I think, the AGU audience that we're speaking today. Um, something that I've heard is um, from people who have backgrounds in environmental and earth science, uh, in environmental and earth sciences, is a lot of the things that you might be st studying could be impacted by local policies. And so that sort of coupling between, you know, your scientific work and the communities where you might want to get engaged um, in can make it a little bit difficult to know exactly how, how can I participate in a policy process while still remaining and appearing objective about my scientific work. And so I was wondering if um, you have any thoughts or advice to share about this potential tension. And I'd like to start with you, Allison, because that's an area that you know you are actually working in a university and also working on um, city policy for. So I'll start by saying um, local governments can benefit hugely from partnering with research institutions. So I, I want to start with that. We often need answers that we cannot afford to get. And we have the University of Louisville, for example, here locally that has hundreds of graduate students who need research projects. So there's a huge value for both in those types of partnerships. And I think when you have that type of partnership, you're able to present your research and data in a way that you can still maintain an unbiased approach because you're not advocating for what you believe is right, you're advocating for what that research points to. So I think approaching it from that way um, provides data that is needed, um, and it also provides someone to analyze and interpret that data so that local um, governments can then use that in the best way possible. Thanks, Allison. Chanel, do you have something to add to that? Sure. I think it, as Allison stated, being really clear about um, the, the interest that you're pursuing, which is for your research to be clearly understood and for the um, sort of outcomes or I guess for the findings that your research is suggesting uh, would be like responsibly understood and implemented. Um, I, I sort of love the philosophy that there's no such thing really as an unbiased individual. Like for example, we here are biased to want to follow, you know, evidence and for the facts. Generally, we here are biased to want to, you know, promote a more sustainable planet, a more equitable society. And so I, I tend to lead with that. This was a tension that I experienced as a staffer. Where on the one hand, I'm serving at the, uh, you know, serving the policy platform of the elected member for whom I serve, who actually uh, differed a bit from my own personal political ideologies. And on the one hand, with NSPN, for example, I'm like a very staunch science advocate. And sometimes those two weren't always on the same page. So if my elected member would say, Chanel, you know, as a scientist, sort of what's your perspective or position, I would often lead with, well, uh, in the interest of advancing equity in transit, the data suggests that this would be uh, a way to, to advance that, right? You know, in the interest of, you know, um, reducing uh, harm to the XYZ population, this data suggests that that would be helpful. And so I sort of put up, I'm pushing in that moment to then sort of help the couch or frame where I'm coming from. And in other conversations, I might say, oh, sir, in the interest of addressing a concern about return on value, here's some data I can present to you on that. And so I think just being really honest and transparent about what bias, if you want to call it that, you have, helps us to separate when we're wearing whichever hat. But I think that it hasn't necessarily served science well in terms of what I feel is our civic duty to say, well, I'm just going to generate data and the data will speak for itself. It doesn't, you know, data is just, is, is the way of like measuring, you know, things in the world. Um, we do have a responsibility to help shape these narratives because other entities are out there shaping narratives all day. And so if you're not at the table, you're on the table. And so I think it's 
sort of an interesting opportunity for science and scientists to sort of reevaluate how do we want to show up and not be afraid of, oh, I'm going to lose my objective facts. No, we can objectively advocate for equity, for a cleaner planet, for social justice, for, you know, you know that it increases our power in politics and in policy. Thank you. Chris, do you have an, anything to add? Yeah, I think Chanel said it really well that no other, from my experience advocating and from talking with different staffers, no other group in the same way that scientists and engineers do don't advocate for themselves. There are you are, if you are advocating, you are one of dozens, if not hundreds of people that um, is meeting with these elected officials or with your policymaker. And to say that you don't deserve a seat at the table really just means that science and engineering won't have a seat at the table because there are lots of other interest groups that are going to be advocating for their interests. So I think it's really important. Um, and it does, it, I think it, it might be uncomfortable for folks to do it, especially starting out, but just recognizing that the value um, that your research and experience brings um, and not being afraid to share that. Great, thank you. So I think we, we're kind of getting close to the end. We have one um, question from the audience that I thought would be a great way to wrap up the discussion, which was, which is, where do you recommend individuals get started if they want to get involved with science policy? And you've all taken such different routes to get there that I'm really excited to hear all of your answers. And so um, let me start with you, Chanel, and then go to Chris and then to Allison. I highly recommend joining us at the National Science Policy Network, particularly if you're an early career researcher. As I was stating during my talk, and actually Chris Jackson um, is also a member of this coalition, uh, but it's a great opportunity, particularly if you're still a trainee, uh, grad student, postdoc, you know, anywhere along the academic pathway, really, uh, to number one, you know, find a community of people that are engaged at various levels, you know, sort of low, still learning, the folks who are, uh, you know, sort of full-time employed as staffers in government somewhere. Uh, and they host uh, all sorts of programs and projects from memo writing, op-ed writing, uh, virtual uh, town hall visitations, uh, meeting with elected reps and their staffers, um, Wikipedia editing to sort of uh, increase the visibility of scientists, particularly uh, scientists from backgrounds that have historically not received as much attention. The, li the list goes on. And so um, it's a community of over uh, like you know, hun hundreds and hundreds of um, students, uh, postdocs. It's just a great way to network and sort of um, get, get a sense of the landscape. So uh, I, I serve as the mentorship and professional development coordinator. And so we look forward to uh, seeing perhaps uh, many uh, newcomers uh, as a result of this talk. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think this is a great question. And commonly it's one of the things that I hear a lot when talking with folks about science policy, it's taking that first step, right? How can I take the first step to get engaged? Um, so I'm gonna take this opportunity to plug some of ESAL's resources, including our local engagement playbook, um, where if you go into there, you can find a, kind of find, we have step-by-step -step guides for a number of different ways to get engaged locally. And you can kind of pick and choose what's most interesting to you. You want to learn, right, if you want to think about how to research um, a policy or initiative, um, or maybe now, especially in the days of Zoom, when you can watch um, public meetings mostly virtually, um, you can kind of go watch your city council meeting, go watch a committee meeting, kind of learn about the issues that are being discussed in your community and think about where your science and engineering perspective um, can um, be added and add value to those conversations. And then really think about how you can expand um, then go from there. I think my experience engaging in local government, you open one door, um, right? And then you start to build those relationships. You start to um, um, kind of get to know folks. And then if you continue to engage and engage persistently, then you can um, kind of keep going and make a real impact locally. Thank you, Chris. And Allison, do you want to close out the discussion? I will. Look, everybody wants in a meeting with the mayor or with their council person. Um, but please remember, you're not just engaging as a scientist, you are engaging as a resident. I cannot tell you how important it is to have people show up at public meetings, to offer public comments, to give comments on a draft planning effort, because someone like me who does community engagement then takes those comments and says, look, here's what we need to do because this is what the community wants. Not just a scientist, but the people that we serve. So please get involved locally, join a neighborhood association, go to a council meeting, learn the landscape as Chanel pointed out, understand what local government versus state government is responsible for, and just please participate. 
Well, thank you so much. This is great advice. And I will, you know, we just shared the link to our playbook. We actually have a step-by-step um, -step guide on how to effectively deliver public comments. So please take Allison up. Um, I, I think it's a great way to engage and get started and make your views known. Um, so I think we're just at the bottom of the hour. I have Again, it's been a thrill to have a conversation with such a great group of panelists. And thank you everyone for joining this discussion, for thinking about what you can do as engineers and scientists engaging locally in your community. There's so much we can do. And um, I really hope to hear more about what you're doing. You can always reach us at ESAL and let us know. Thank you.